Hello, and welcome to the making of interactive NFTs. I'm Dr. Abstract, and here we are on the TIA site, formerly Hicketnunk, and we've got a bunch of interactive NFTs here. We've done uh, a series. This is a series of the making of these. We've done one on air balls, and we're going to scroll on down. Ooh, let's do one of the early ones. So here's one of the early ones. It's called the Venusian Vase Vendor. Oh, how exciting is that? So let's have a look. That's here. And hmm, ooh, so we can make the vase wiggly or straight like that. Anybody who's done generative art recognizes this now as a noise pattern. So we're using simplex noise here. And then this is scrolling through the noise pattern. Uh, this dial right here is making it bumpier or less bumpy. So that's zooming in on the noise pattern. You see how we've zoomed in on that. And as we zoom out, we see more of the bumps of the equation. And it becomes more like true noise. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and the idea is we're, we're, we're designing vases. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> so the Venusian vase vendor. You can also click it on auto here. And then it will cycle through itself. Um, at various sort of like at a speed here we go and, and make different vases on auto but as soon as we try all it's doing is it's animating that slider up and down but as soon as um we use something like the dial but doom oh the dial i think is fine we can change the dial and the slider will still slide but as soon as we pick up the slider then we're assuming that we're on manual mode for that buzz. All right, let's go in and take a look at the code. So we'll leave that running. Here's the code. Mm, all of this stuff is in a VVV folder, Venusian Vase Vendor folder. <laughs> and there's our assets. The strip deco thing is just an animated GIF of that that we would see on the TIA site. Um, we would zip this up and we would upload it to Tia, formerly Hicketnuck, or objkt.xyz, uh, um, or any of, uh, any of those other ones. And it would then, is on the Tezo blockchain, it would then post it on interplanetary file system, and so be it. But everything in your interactive NFT needs to be within the directory here. There are some allowed links out to certain sites, but uh, for the most part, your stuff needs to be self-contained. So our scripts are inside of here and we're calling things locally. So there's the local call. We're using Zim. Zim is a JavaScript Canvas framework at zimjazz.com. Quick look at that, zimjazz.com. That's right here. We actually made an NFT that's very similar to our banner. And as a matter of fact, if you click on the banner, then this is what the NFT looked like, and it chops up into a puzzle, which we're going to show you in just a second. As soon as this, this sweeps from one corner to another, it has to cross all four corners in there, and now it's done it. It should have done it. <laughs> Come on, chop, any minute. There we go. Ooh, wow. Okay, so then we would do a puzzle. So that's an interactive generative art piece, and something like that is on FX Hash. All right, so that, that's Zim. Zim is a JavaScript Canvas framework um, for coding creativity. It's much like processing uh, or P5.js, but it has more components and uh, lots of conveniences and wonderful controls. Uh, it's, it's like a sort of a modern version of perhaps of what Flash could do. All right, so we come on down here, and the purpose of this series is to talk about how these interactive NFTs were made, what was the coding behind it? There is another there is another video or two that show you how to upload your interactive NFT and mint and, and so forth. So we'll give you the links to that in the description of the, the video. So we're bringing in our assets here. In this case, it's just a font. If we're only bringing in one asset, we don't actually have to make an array of it. So there we are bringing in a font asset with the name of the font and the font. 
if we were to bring in images, we could just say something like uh, pick.png here. And then these assets would be preloaded. They're coming from an assets folder. There's the assets folder. And we pass that into the frame. So the frame calls is a framework. We're fitting. I can tell this is an older one. We can now fit with a capital FIT constant there. So we're fitting this size, 1024 by 1024, um, into the browser window. So as you can see, the browser window will fit that uh, square dimension. The reason we went square is, first of all, the design looked good in square, and Tia uh, will preview your NFT in square. Uh, so most people just see the NFT in square. There's a little uh, view maximize, and if you maximize, it will open it up in full screen, at which point it would look like this, which is fine for this design. We don't really care about the bars at the back. So a fit mode with a square dimension works well, uh, and we use that for a lot of our interactive NFTs. But you don't have to. There's also a full mode, which will be full screen. There's a few other ones, and we'll see that as we go through the series. So this is the color of what we call the stage. This thing that where we view the stuff is called the stage. That's what it was called in Flash. That's what it was called in Director. Um, so that's our metaphor for building interactive media. And then the darker color is what color it is around the outside. That's the outer color. And there's our assets in our path. Great. When the frame is ready, if you're coming from processing, I don't know if you have events, but this is quite common in JavaScript. Uh, you would have an event that would add event listener. That's the same thing. As a matter of fact, add event listener would work here. It's just uh, CreateJS, which is what Zim is built on, has shortened that nicely to on. <laughs> Very readable. Frame.on ready. This is the type of event. And then here's the arrow function that we run when we're ready. We're given a stage uh, a width and a height. Uh, as mentioned, the purpose of this is to go through the code that was used to make the interactive NFT and not so much to introduce you to Zim. There are many videos that will help you do that. There's the Zim Basics one. It's a whole series of, of basics in Zim. There's the uh, coding... Um, creative coding with Zim uh, or with JavaScript, and that's that's done through the canvas. It really makes sense to learn how to code on the canvas. Very visual, very easy, a lot easier than the DOM version of uh, JavaScript. I mean, it's the same JavaScript. It's just we're coding with a, a framework here on the canvas rather than coding the DOM. Uh, still JavaScript. So here are some references for what we're doing. Oh, those you can take a look at that too. The learn section will have all those videos as well. And here we are making a backing and this is for the blend mode to work. As you can see, we've got a blend mode going on uh, across here. Oh, maybe you, you don't know that, but there's a, a blend mode that's happening to make those colors. Uh, you can't blend against the canvas. It's the canvas itself can't be seen. So we, we're putting something on the stage and that will allow us to blend mode on that. Uh, minor detail. Um, here's the first slider that's made. So Zim has sliders and dials and we're setting the length of the bar. We're setting it to vertical. We're making a custom button on that. Oh yeah, I see it's kind of got a, a gloss on it. So uh, our buttons does have a gloss and there it is. <laughs> Haven't used gloss in a while. Decided to, to use it in this case. Not, not sure if you can see that. You see that little gloss where it's darker on the bottom and lighter on the top. Oh, <laughs> brings me back to early, early iPhone uh, stuff. But anyway, um, we've chosen a corner of zero. We could have easily left that default or made it something like a corner of 20 if you don't like the to Ooh, maybe not 20. How big is this button? The button's not all that big. Ah, right, it's only got a height of 30, so we definitely wouldn't want 20. Um, how about 10? There we go. So that's more of like, well, curves anyway. Um, but I like a corner of zero now and then. And we're, we're putting nothing in that label. So this is a custom button. Usually we don't have to do that. As a matter of fact, there's, there's a lot of different types of buttons that we could put in here. There's pill, if we just wanted a pill. 
like that. Um, so there's a bunch of default. That's that's a pill. There's Aztec. The default, if we don't say any button, is just a square button, and that looks like this. So we decide that's a pretty basic looking slider, and we decided to just apply our own custom button to that. And hence, we're passing in a new button as the button for the slider, and then we can make whatever we want in the button. We could make that, uh, we could pass in an icon in here instead of this other stuff. We could make a, a image background, etc. So uh, we're also applying a damp on the slider because uh, when, once we do that, it gives this sort of, um, it, you see how that doesn't move. I don't know if you can tell, it doesn't quite move right away. And as I, as I finish sliding, it, it um, takes, it's more natural. It, it, it doesn't chop off right away. Perhaps we could see what that looks like if we did chop off right away. So that's damp off. Like that, and we go here. And now, you see that? It just like stops. As soon as I stop moving the slider, it stops, and it's instant, blah, 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 like that. So that's not quite as organic, and it's so easy just to say, hey, let's add a little bit of damping to that slider. And then the current value, it's not, it, it, it heads towards, you see that? Mm, much nicer, oh. And it heads towards the value and damps towards it, something like, like an easing. Okay. And we're setting a current value in the middle. We're positioning that. Uh, Zim's got pose. There's a variety of different ways that we can add things to the stage. And by the way, we can add to any container. Some container could have gone here, but if we don't specify, then it will add to the stage. And this is similar to HTML, where you can say top, right, center, well actually in HTML I don't think you can do center, but top, right, etc. Here we're posing, and this will pose at 60 from the right and zero from the center. And indeed, there's our slider right here. Uh, it's centered and it's uh, 60 from the right hand side. If we wanted our slider on the left, well we could put left here, and then our slider would be on the left, probably hit the, well there it is, okay, on the left. Woo. Okay, so that's one way. You can also center something just like uh, we could have said slider.center, slider.center reg centers it and centers the registration point. We can locate, loc locates the registration point of um, the object, whereas pose positions the edge. So it'll position the right edge against the right side or the left edge against the left side. Um, and I suppose, and we just, we have an add to as well, where we just add to and it doesn't position anywhere. It just adds it to zero, zero, I guess, or whatever it's X and Y is. So those are the ways that we can add. And they're, they're all chainable. Note that we're chaining on to the end of these things. Usually we just make the object we chain quite often. That, that brings us, I don't know if I have an example here. Uh, here we have a toggle. Often we don't even need to store a variable. We might just chain it and everything's good. Uh, we put it in a variable so that we can get the toggle information, but we could have used E and said E.target here. Oops. And not even have stored toggle in a variable at all. So that's what chaining will give us. And so therefore we've made a bunch of short little chainable uh, methods like SCA to be able to chain the scale. If we didn't have that short chainable method, uh oh, where did it go? Uh, container, I want a container there. If we didn't have that short little chainable method, we're back down here in the SCA, um, we'd have to drop out and say toggle dot scale is equal to 0.5. Could do that too. Uh, you'll see a lot of frameworks, etc., cetera, would, wouldn't do it there. They would have to make the toggle uh, they might not even position it or apply the event. Instead of positioning and applying an event, we would toggle.scale, we would toggle.position or whatever it is, or .x is equal to whatever, 50 toggle.y, toggle.y is equal to 50. Uh, then we would say toggle.on, and that event would be in here like a click or Oh, what is this, a change event? Yeah, change event. So toggle dot on change, call this arrow function. So you'd have to store your object in a variable, 
and then operate on that variable. That's very common. But in Zim, we, we chain, and that makes this a lot easier. So let's have a look at this in comparison. What do we have here? Dot ska. I have to undo these things anyway. 0.5. And then let's not put anything in the change. So here we are saying a new toggle. Dot ska. Dot pose. Dot change. Uh, and actually the position, we'd have to do more in the calculations on the position if we're just using X and Y there. Um, so you see what we've done? We've, we've, we've saved lots of uh, half as much typing, basically, for the most part. If we were just locate, locating it, we wouldn't need those things. That would be the equivalent, I suppose, something like that anyway. And if we count, uh, yeah, that's it. This is 98 characters. Yep, 98 characters. This is 128 characters. So in this case, um, whatever, it's kind of like a, uh, we saved a quarter of it in that case, just with those guys. There we are. Nope, not quite. Uh, heading on back to where we were, though. Bloop, 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 bloop. We're up in the slider. Did we do the slider already? I don't know if we did. What's this timeout? Oh, no, we, I'm not sure. Did we just finish the time? Uh, that we were talking about pose right here. Okay, so we've posed the slider. Now, uh, in a timeout, after half a second, uh, uh, yeah, after half a second, we are wiggling the current value. wonder why we didn't wiggle right away. Probably could have. Anyway, there we are wiggling the slider. Oh, um, yeah, we're wiggling the slider and we're wiggling its current value. It's going to start at 5 because that's where it started. We could have said slider.currentValue there as well if we wanted to. But we hard-coded it. Probably would have been better to say slider.currentValue, whatever that is. And that way, if we change that, it'll be correct here from three to five. So we're only wiggling in the, from three to five into in this sort of uh, region here. What does the slider go to? 10 by default. Well, that's it. Oh, this is how much we're wiggling. So from, from um, the slider's current value, which is five, okay, visually we can see. So this is where it starts, it's gonna wiggle a minimum of three and a maximum of five. So that's positive or minus. So that's plus or minus, which means it'll go basically from five up to eight or five up to 10 or five down to two or five down to zero. Yeah, so it's going up and down. And then this is the time that we're wiggling, which is quite a long time, 20 seconds to 25 seconds. So if we wiggled quickly, like two to five seconds, let's see what that looks like. That's too fast. We can't see the vases. Okay, so sometimes it's taking two seconds to go. Sometimes it's taking five seconds to go. Sometimes it's going farther. Sometimes it's not. So that's, that's what Wiggle's doing. Uh, we could wiggle even faster, like 0.2 to 0.5, for instance. And then here's a fast wiggle. Okay. Which vase would you like? <laughs> Where are the Venusian vase vendors? We, we think very quickly here. Tell me when. <laughs> All right. But uh, we want a longer wiggle, a more gentle wiggle, to just uh, enjoy the vases as they go by. So uh, here's our gentle wiggle. Which vase would you like now? Say when. And we have a better chance at uh, picking a nice vase. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, cool. Huh? The slider on mouse down, we're saying if the toggle is toggled, what is the toggle? Do we have a toggle? Have we seen it yet? That dial, a toggle. So the toggle is down here. It's a new toggle. Ah, it's this toggle right here. Doop -a -doop. And 
and we've made the indicator type of the toggle square. We're starting toggle true. And when we change it, we're going to wiggle the slider that amount. Else, we're going to stop animate. All right, so if we've changed it to be not toggled, then we're going to stop the animate on the toggle. A wiggle is really just zim animate, but it, it, what it does is it animates one direction, and then it says, okay, I'm done going that direction. Now I'll set another animation to go past the middle. That's one thing that animate can't do. Uh, if you start with it in the middle, animate can loop. It can go forward and backwards, forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards, but it can't really go forwards, backwards past the middle, and keep on going past the middle. So you can kind of, you could cheat with two animations. You can say, okay, animate a certain direction this amount, and then animate back and forth across the middle. Anyway, we made wiggle, which is really just animate uh, like a, that compilation we just mentioned, and with a few other tricks behind it. This, these little mins and maxes, the start position. Uh, there's a few other parameters after this as well. Wiggle has been delightful. I don't know if you recall, what was it? Um, Adobe's After Effects had animations. It had a wiggle in it. I still remember that. And Flash never had the wiggle. And I always said, I wish we had a wiggle. <laughs> anyway, so we've made a wiggle here. Um, so there we are wiggling based on the toggle. And if we change the slider, if it's toggled, then we're turning off the toggle, I guess, and stopping the animate. That's right. So if it's already stopped, we don't bother. But if it if it is wiggling, then we want to set the toggle to false and stop animating. Okay, and that's what happens when we pick up the slider. Watch the toggle there. Boop. Okay, toggle just turned off, and now it's it's no longer animating as well, because we're assuming that we've just gone into manual mode. Okay, here's a label that is Venusian Vaz Vendor with a couple backslash ends in there to go. Uh, that's the size of the font. Here's the font itself, and there's the color of the font. We're jumping to an align center here. Align center, I'm not sure. I suppose it is, it is a parameter. Let's go have a look at the docs and see where that parameter is. So here is, well, here's Zim. I'll show you how to get to the docs. There's docs. Click on docs, type in label. So the text, what the text of the label is, the size. The font, the color, the roll color, the shadow color, the shadow blur, then the align. So we'd have to do a couple nulls or undefines. We'd have to, do we get to the color? One, two, three. One, two, three, and then we have a line. So we could have done it this way. Lighter, colon, null, colon, null, colon, comma, null, comma, mm, center. Okay. So that that would do it. Uh, with Zim, we have Zim, what's called Zim Duo. So we could also do this. Uh, well, uh, before we show the Zim Duo, let me just so you see what we've done. Instead, we applied a style a line center and turn the style off. We now have this, which uh, is once colon true, and we won't have to turn it off. So what this would do is it would apply the align center once, basically, and then turn that off so that the dial wouldn't be align centered, whatever that might mean on the dial, or the tile wouldn't be align centered. That would align everything in the tile in the center. Maybe we want that, maybe we don't. Um, so that's how Zim style works. Uh, we could also have said label. Oops, if I can spell label, we'll have these styles. Uh, I guess we could have left it there like that. But I'll put a semicolon there. So that means we've applied the style directly to only labels, and then the dial and the tile wouldn't get styled with an align center. Oh, well, it wouldn't anyway because of the once. But um, I'm not sure. I can't remember what that once does if we put it in the label. It probably applies to a label once. Okay, so we could have done that to make sure that it's not applied to other things. But then every label from now on... So how style works in Zim is everything made from now on would, would have whatever style is set in style. And there's different things that we can do with style. Lots of stuff. Um, but we could also... 
say, instead of label, we could say, I don't know, interface or something like that. And that's like a class. Uh, we call it a group here in Zim because we, we're already dealing with classes. Label is a class, for instance, so we didn't want to get confused. But then we could apply a group to this. We'd have to go to the group, uh, null, common, null, whatever to get to the group parameter, which is at the end, and say, we're group interface. And as you can see, uh, oh, sorry, with quotes. As you can see from the docs here, though, we're nowhere close to the end of the label parameter. There's the group. So we'd have to go lots of nulls to get there. And we recognize that in Zim Duo, Zim 2, Zim Duo, we call it. Uh, we recognize that, that it'd be ridiculous to put in that many to, to get to there. So what we did is we introduced the Zim Duo technique, where instead of normal parameters like that, we're also able to pass in object uh, literals, or per, um, what we might call configuration objects. So this is the text of it. 42 is the size of it. So we're just using the parameter names as properties here. This is the font. This is the color. We don't need any of the nulls. Bup, 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 bup. This is the align. We don't need that null. And well, we would have had a bunch more nulls to get to this one, and this is the group. Like that. Well, by this time, if, if we've got the center in there, we don't need a style that says the group. So this is how you would say, this label is part of that group, and uh, anything in that group will be align centered. So you see that that's like classes in CSS. So very much like CSS, but it's actually reversed. CSS is very much like object literals. Um, and that's what we're using inside of here, object literals. We would put commas in here and say, well, what else could it be? It could be alpha, uh, colon, point 0.2, or any of these. So if we said color, comma, color. So basically, any parameter can be used as a style. Uh, color, we, uh, we have some wonderful options here as well. If we said blue, red, then randomly it would pick from those colors. It would either be blue or red. Um, the next label that gets made would either be blue or red. We could make a series. So if we said series here, like this, then the first label that's made is blue. The next label that's made is red, etc. You can do things to the series. You could bounce the series. I can't remember. Rewind the series. And so it goes back and forth. You can skip numbers. So uh, if we said dot every or whatever, that would be every two. Um, it would be two blues, two reds, etc. So very powerful stuff, all of this. Um, in Zim, as far as I know, we're the only Canvas framework with, with style. You can style the Canvas tag. But the stuff in the canvas tag is all just one big picture. So there is no native sort of styling of that. However, we made it. The reason we were able to make style so easily is because we already handled the Zim Duo technique. We were already doing basic. <laughs> we looked at this and said, you know, this looks a lot like style. If we just generalize this, took this stuff out up here, and we basically made style for the canvas in a week or less. So imagine that, remaking CSS in, in less than a week. It's like, oh, okay, that was actually pretty easy. <laughs> uh, and I do, mm, yeah, that's probably getting there. And then we can say the style was aligned center on that, like so. Okay, we don't need this stuff. Ooh. So I was just a little bit uh, lazy there, and we said style. This is how you can turn off style. This is the way I turn it off. There's also, you can use the style class directly, style.clear, like that. And there's a bunch of commands uh, like that to remember the style and to apply the style again, etc. Anyway, either one of those. I, I usually just, this was the first way we did it, and then we introduced the style class. So I'm used to just setting it to nothing. Okay, um, we have our label and it is strip deco and let's have a look at the, the label there. So there it is on the left hand side, Venusian vase vendor. Let me tell you folks, if 
if you make something, this is some generative art, if you're going to add something to the generative art, um, if you've come from the processing side, you'd probably be adding sliders and something like a dial. A dial, a dial is basically just a slider. It's the same thing, except its form factor is different. So instead of it being a straight line, it's basically a box, which is handy to have that option. Um, in your dat GUI or whatever you'd be using up here, that doesn't really blend in well with your art. It really doesn't. So I would hesitate to make an NFT with a dat GUI st sitting up here. I just wouldn't do it. However, I would have a final product here, an integrated interface. And when you do, use custom fonts that relate to your NFT. And, and there we have it. It just immediately adds well, it doesn't subtract from your art, let's put it that way, <laughs> and immediately can add to your art. Um, so the way I look at it, when I make generative art uh, NFTs, is I treat it almost like I'm making a lava lamp or something like that. You know, like a product that has beauty in it that somebody has recognized this physical beauty of these blobs moving. But then it has a form as well, and that, I think, is more... Sail, saleable is that the word for it <laughs> anyway so there you go and, and not only that it, it could be used in nfts but it can also be used for interactive media for um, marketing and you know, advertising and and people's products and e-learning it looks good all right so keep that in mind and um, with that in mind on the zim site here top I can head on back to the zim site there's, well, I suppose we can find it this way. I'm going to give you this link. It's under, there, NFTs right here. This used to be the front of Zim, but now we're no longer on version Zim NFT. We're on version Zim Zim. <laughs> Amazing. But this is a link that I'm going to give you. And in there is this inner invite for generative art makers and interactive artists right there. So please have a look there. It talks about what I've just been talking about showing lots of examples as we go. Uh, this is the site also that has how you can make it, as well as uh, video tutorials on how to make stuff. That's for Tezos. Here's the video tutorials down here for, uh, for FX Hash. Okay. So back to the code, shall we? All that just from a font. <laughs> There we are using the font. Um, we are making the dial here and positioning the dial, scaling the dial. We're making our noise equation. And then we're preparing for a, a tile. So we've got a tile. This is uh, This thing is a tile, but it looks like it only has one column and lots of rows wouldn't you say? So we're tiling a rectangle. All The rectangles will all have their registration points centered. We've got one column and depending on the number of parts, which is right here, 60, 60 parts to it. So one column and 60 rows basically. Zero is the spacing horizontally. We don't. We only have one column, so there's, it doesn't really matter what we put for the spacing. And three is the spacing, so there's a three pixel spacing between these. I wonder what it would look like if that were zero. Oh. Let me put my cursor in here. If that were zero, then what would we get? Okay. Uh, a few things happened. One, I've got it shifted the size of this. You can see these slight gaps in there. That's a canvas issue where it can't quite um, make zero happen. So sometimes we go minus 0.5. Although if we're running a blend mode on that, that might affect our blend mode. Yeah. So with a blend mode, we're we're out of luck because now we're duplicating on the blend mode. So anyway, a gap is fine. I don't mind a gap. And then we're rotating each of these. Is that rotating the tile? Let's have a look. Yeah, we're rotating the tile 180. So we made this horizontal tile, I get. Oh, did we? Oh, we flipped it around. Why did we flip it around? I have no idea. And we centered it. I think it was just easier 
that way. I, I'm not sure if it related to the noise equations. We just rotated the whole tile. The, what that would do is when you make a tile, it's going to make it from the top to the bottom. And if we rotate it around, it's now sort of being the, the, the first thing that we're going to operate is on will be on the bottom. So you see, see what I mean? Uh, normally the tiles from the top to the bottom. Therefore, if we apply something, I'm not sure what we would be. Oh, I know what it is. Yeah, okay. You know when you change the, the uh, zoom, in a sense, of the wave equation like that? Normally it would have changed it from the top. Well, if this is a vase, the vase grow, the vase base is at the bottom. So I wanted that to grow from the bottom like that. I actually don't know how to make that grow from the center. I wouldn't have wanted it to grow any other way. I like it growing from the bottom. Uh, I don't actually know how to make that grow from the center. There's probably a way to do it. But anyway, there it, it was growing from, from here, but that was up at the top. So you know what I mean? Well, Hey, let's demonstrate a demonstration. So if we didn't rotate, well, if we didn't, if I could have deleted that and you know, then it would have been not rotated. I'll just set that to zero for now. So here we go, it kind of kind of looks the same, but watch. Now it, it um, it's growing from, you see how it's moving from the top, top is staying still. And it looks like the vase is being pushed through the floor. And so I didn't like that. So uh, an e easy solution. <laughs> there might have been a code solution down below when we did the noise, but noise is never quite easy. Or it's always slightly mystical. <laughs> so I know what I'm doing here. Uh, uh, let's just turn that around. Rotate 180. Yeah. Uh, so here we go. And now it doesn't it doesn't go through the ground. Rather, it, it sort of like goes up through the top, which is I, I find more aesthetic. Okay. So, and then we're centering that. Okay, that's our tile. Here's a ticker. A ticker runs constantly, and it's, it's like the math class. There's only one ticker available, even if we have multiple frames, one ticker. And we're going to add a function to that ticker. A ticker, imagine it's like a queue. It's, it's running a request animation frame. The ticker runs a request animation frame with a stage.update in it right at the end. And so basically you can add any functions you want to that ticker and it will queue, it will do that, um, that function and then do the one stage.update at the end. Even our animates and wiggles and, and th that type of stuff, um, drags, etc. they all use the same ticker. They all add functions to that ticker. So it's a wonderful system for complete efficiency. We're only updating the stage uh, once. Some places like uh, Box2D or 3JS, uh, different engines like that, uh, processing as well usually, I think. Update always. So processing is always processing. There probably is a way to stop that uh, in processing. I don't know. Though. But anyway, uh, and, and 3JS, you know, it's 3D. It's always seems in motion and stuff. It's more like a visualization engine. And so that's fine. And physics, physics needs to perhaps run all the time too. Maybe not, but usually has to do all its calculations. So that's understandable. But with interactive media, if we're not, if we're not moving, so if I go like this, nothing's moving. It's sort of like, um, why did we, why did we, up, why are we updating the stage constantly? That's wearing out battery. It's one of the things that Flash did. It just constantly updated the stage and wore out battery. So we have developed a system where we don't we don't update the stage unless you update the stage so down at the bottom here oh at the bottom i didn't even have to do an update the stage oh i did <laughs> here it is i didn't really have to because we start oh i did yeah we didn't really start directly animating i was going to say you see how we were paused to start i think i just wanted to ground people and say here's a vase and now here we are going to move it i think that's why we put just a little bit of a delay in there um, but anyway, once it, once it starts moving, that's the ticker going, we don't need the update stage. As a matter of fact, did we do the ticker right away? If we did, 
Yeah, we didn't even sort of wait that pause. So we've got a ticker running. That means we don't need the stage.update here. That was just an extra stage.update. Anyway, usually, uh, sometimes we leave that in there anyway, because if people are modifying this, and for instance, they took the ticker out, and we don't have a stage.update, here's what we're going to see. Oh, <laughs> it's still updated. How, how come it updated? I don't know. Some, something else somewhere must have been animated uh, and caused it to update. But anyway, usually uh, at that point, they wouldn't even see anything at all. They would think it's broken. It's, well, it's because we didn't do a stage.update. So we have to manually stage.update sometimes. I'm not sure what uh, something in here anyway did that up update for us. So no worries. No, oh, whatever. Um, that's actually a beginner thing in Zim and on the canvas in CreateJS, for instance. Uh, something that happens a lot is you've got this event. I clicked on this thing. Nothing happened. W why didn't it happen? Why didn't my circle disappear? It's because, well, you clicked on it, but you didn't do a stage.update after you removed the circle. So we have a stage.update that is quite often has to be done on events uh, because events happen later. Uh, anyway, here we are uh, looping through our tile now. So this is in our ticker. We're going to loop through our tile. So this is a Zim loop, tile.loop. Tile has a bunch of stuff in it. It's got all those parts, 60 parts. And when we loop, ooh, this is a while back. Why the heck didn't we use an arrow function there? So we would use an arrow function like so. Must have just forgot. Uh, these days, it doesn't slip my mind. I must always use arrow functions. We use one there. So we're going to collect the rect. Uh, that, that's each of the rectangles in the tile. And the index number that we're on. Do we use the index number? Indeed, we do. Okay, that's, that's taking us through the noise equation. So we're getting some value. And what the idea is, we're going to scale the, that rectangle piece. So we're scaling the rectangle piece only in the X. Yeah, that makes sense. So if we refresh here, basically we're scaling the X, the, the X value, the horizontal, a certain scale depending on the noise equation. And we want that to scale out. Our noise goes from 0 to 1. I think if I recall or does yeah, I think our noise goes from zero to one as opposed to negative one to one. So we need to kind of mirror that. And that's what 0.5 is doing, I think. So we're taking half of, this is the scale. So we're taking half of our scale and adding, maybe we got a negative uh, scale scale value. I can't remember. Why don't we look? Have a, a peek at noise. So we go to the docs of Zim. We type in noise, noise, and let's recall whether we got that. Seed, 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 boot, doot, 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 doot. Property, seed, simplex. Ah, oh, right. Returns a noise value between minus one and, mi and one. So we do have a value between minus one and one. So half the scale, taking that value, adding one to it, dividing it by half, that will make it, oh, at least half. Okay, so this is kind of like a minimum scale. Otherwise, it would scale to <clears throat> minus one and times some sort of max scale five. And then we're not scaling the height. So that's the height of um, it. We're keeping the height scale to one. All right, so that's making sure it's at least 0.5, and then we're uh, adjusting the minus 1 to 1 values by some max scale here. That's the amplitude of our change. And then this is the noise. So how do we get this value? How do we get our noise equation value? We ask noise for 2D noise in this case. So we're passing in two parameters. And the first one is whatever the slider's current value is. So this is the slider right here. So whatever this is, that, that will tell us where along the noise equation we're going. You see how as we move the slider, it almost moves, moves our pointer along the noise equation. Imagine this, the noise equation. Uh, we're just sliding along the noise equation. That's why we used a slider. It sort of represents or feels like we're doing the motion along the equation. 
with the dial, we could have done a horror's, no, this is a squashed uh, amount. So I don't know, we could have probably done a slider for the squash as well, but we just wanted to show off the dial. Here is, um, that's based on I times the dial's current value. So um, each I is a little bit different as we go through the noise equation. And then we're taking the slider value will, uh, in a sense, tell us how many bumps we have. So that's what's zooming in and out of the noise equation itself. Now we're zoomed out and we can see more of the equation. If we zoom in, zoom, 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 it appears smoother. The curve is smoother because we're zoomed in on that noise equation. Okay, I, I like it zoomed in, although that looks more like a, a beer glass. Mmm. <laughs> I could use a beer glass. Uh, or can we get a wine glass? Or we can get a goblet for sure. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> we'll call that one. Maybe a little bit more bumpy for wine. Uh, there we go. Nice, huh? Um, all right. So there we are applying noise. Here's our toggle button. That we've kind of already looked at. I think we looked at that quickly. When we change it, we start to wiggle or we stop the enemy. And then we have a label auto. We're positioning that at a certain place. And a rectangle, which is doing what? Ah, here's our uh, blend mode over top of that. So we've made a rectangle. We've applied a linear gradient to it. We could these days. We don't usually do it this way. These days we make a gradient color. So that's in here. And we call that a, gradi a gradient color, like so. So that's us passing in a color to the rectangle. Uh, we don't do the linear gradient anymore. That was the old way. Uh, we're gradiating between these three colors. Uh, remember, these are Zim colors. You could turn them into HTML colors if you wanted to. But I bet you this would look as ugly as can be. Let's have a look. Oh, the, the, the HTML pink is just like... Ugh. Something broke. Uh, oh, new gradient color? Yeah, new gradient color. No, oh, whatever. Yeah, that pink just doesn't do it to me. It's sort of like hmm, hot dog. No, not quite hot dog. I don't know. And I don't really like the green and the blue. So, ugh. HTML colors, ladies and gentlemen, or you could have done the number sign zero zero F F F F for red or whatever. If you do that, use quotes on, on those guys. But, and you can also use RGBA and hue saturation value in, in quotes again. But if you're doing Zim colors, you don't need, they're baked in, in a sense. So those have now become global. You can use the Zim namespace, so that would be Zim dot, and you would put Zim dots in front of in front of all these as well. Zim dot, and you could force the global like to have a namespace, and then you wouldn't have all these global variables hanging around. But Zim's a framework, and usually we don't work with other things as much as uh, some other libraries, so we don't usually do the the Zim namespace. But you could. Here's the proportions that those colors will be. Here's where they're located, zero to zero to zero to the tile height, plus five, I guess we've gone just a little bit beyond. And that's our pink to green to blue of the Zim colors. We're centering that and applying a blend mode. So bleh is the blend mode. And we're also making that not uh, be, we're, we're turning the mouse off on it. That means we can click through it because you see we've we've put that rectangle over top of this as well. And that's a nice nice effect, isn't it? So these colors, this is more blue, that's a bit more green. Uh, same with up here. These colors are also being affected by the blend modes. And that can make your interface look uh, stronger. It's a very quick way. Why don't I show you an example of that in the Zim site here. So if we go under examples in the Zim site, we're scrolling down and we're looking for Dr. Abstract's car. Uh, tell me when you see it. Ah, right here. 
So, baby, you can tune my car. This is on CodePen. We've got a lot on CodePen, so that whole middle section is a bunch of examples on CodePen, which means that you can come in here and see the code on, on there. Uh, you hear that? So, that's what we've done. We've done blend phones on this interface here, right across everything. And as you can see, it turns the interface into looking quite exciting. All right, bye-bye. <laughs> I can't think. I turned it down for you. I didn't turn it down for me. <laughs> Still, my headphones really loud, roaring away. But the idea was you use those dials and you could tune the car. You probably wanted to try, didn't you? Anyway, you can come here to zimjazz.com, look at the examples and find the tuning car. But lots of things to explore here. Isn't that exciting? Uh, and this is the NFT section right here. Boop, 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 boop. And then some featured ones, some recent ones keying out we've got chroma key going on. all right so anyway back back out to the code we have a frame dot made width with which is showing that zim thing um yeah it's a it's a risk a part of what we're doing here with these nfts is showing that zim can make nfts so we've got a made width showing there and also uh, i made zim <laughs> so it's sort of like almost my signature on that as well I, I could put a doctor abstract signature on that but for me you don't have to put the made with zim on there you can if you want obviously but um you don't have to do that so that's our reasoning behind that it's also a nice icon isn't it uh, sometimes we don't bother with the made width and it made with <laughs> made with made with uh at which point we would probably do a frame dot uh make icon make icon so there's a frame dot make icon which just makes the icon and then there's a made with which adds the little made with zim thing as well and we got our final staged update that i think we saw we didn't really need <laughs> so uh here are Docs for for things for the items used. So if you wanted to read about blend modes, you could take that URL right there and stick it into a window like so, Boop. and it jumps you into the the blend blend mode information. So it's just operating a cam uh, a what do they call it composite operation. So it's a composite operation that's happening there. Okay, it's a short chainable that just applies. Basically, it's doing the same thing as uh, zim or object dot blend mode, which is the same thing as dot composite operation. But we didn't really like the words composite operation. We'd rather use what say Photoshop's using, which is I think more of a blend mode feel. Okay, so that's look a short wrappable chainable one. So here's some of our other chainables. See how they're all three letters, and that allows you to apply a bunch of different things. All sorts of things in Zim, and you just uh, can open those up, do a search on it. Those are the components. Here are your shapes, components. Oh, sorry. Give you a, a zoom out. Various hit tests, animations and wigglings, some general things, scaling and fitting and stuff. Here are controls that we use. So uh, this is for pages and layouts, like layouts does respond... Uh, I guess you'd call it responsive design. It's it's like a flex box kind of. Our tile itself is also responsive. It has all sorts of things to be responsive as well in it, but uh, for the most part. And, and so is, we got another thing down here called the um, wrapper, which allows you to wrap things. And it's also very responsive, very much like flex box. So effects like um, the various blur and color effects, there's pixel effects, there's turning into a book, scrollers, dynamo, emitters, accelerators, that's to work with sprites. Um, generator is basically does the same thing as processing does. It's got push and uh, pop. Is that what you <laughs> push and pop? I can't remember what you do. Uh, anyway, but it's it's got uh, uh, um, relative drawing. So that's relative drawing, which is the main difference between traditional canvas drawing. When we draw shapes, it's usually absolute drawing. But what processing did, and what we didn't realize until later, is they have relative positions. Oh, rotate five, rotate five, rotate five each each time. And we didn't have that. We'd have to calculate sines and cosines to do that kind of stuff. Well, we put that in generator. So that basically re remakes what processing is doing. 
We have a pen, which is beautiful, animating to sound wave, a synth VR in there. So anyway, um, all sorts of things in Zim, plus helper libraries for game, 3JS sockets, cams, and these pizzazz series. So that's a, a quick view through the docs and some information on frames and loading things like Pix Audio Video SVG in. And why don't we call it a that? We made a Venusian vase vendor. Isn't that wonderful? I, I don't know. I think this might still be available. Let's see. Collect for 15 Tezos. Yep. It's uh, had a history of being bought by people. And now it's it's uh, the last remaining few of these, uh, the three out of ten that are left, are um, available. So this is Hicketnunk. That's the square preview window that it's showing. And then there it is open in a, an open window, or, well, a full full window. The Venusian Vase Vendor. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dr. Abstract. Uh, come visit us at zimjs.com slash slack, zimjs.com slash discord. Love to see you there. Cheers. Cheers.